Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this uh, CA live stream. Uh, we're here today to talk to you about um, all things game audio. Um, I'm uh, Vic Prentice, and I'm uh, one of the senior dialogue engineers here at Creative Assembly. Um, I work across all of our Total War titles, and with me are James and John. Hi, I'm James McGee. I'm the lead sound designer on the console team at CA. Uh, we produce multi-platform titles and uh, most recently released Halo Wars 2 and before that Alien Isolation. Over to John. Hi. Yeah, hi, um, I'm John Newman. I work with the Total War team. Um, I've been working on titles such as Warhammer 2 and the DLCs that followed and Thrones of Britannia uh, and Three Kingdoms. Um, and yeah, over to you Vic. Brilliant. Thank you very much, John. Um, so yeah, today we're going to talk to you a bit more about uh, creating immersive game audio um, for all of our titles. So the uh, processes, the skills required, uh, the tools we use, um, and much more. And uh, we are going to be taking questions uh, throughout the stream. So please do get in touch if you have a question, and we will answer it as best we can. Um, so yeah, to start us off, um, should we talk a little bit more about our roles and what they entail and what we do day to day? Um, James, do you want to kick us off on that? Yep, so I'm a lead sound designer on, on our team and uh, so I still do a lot of sound design and implementation um, but with the lead hat on that also includes some managerial stuff and uh, creative direction stuff. So um, apart from designing sound, I'm responsible for mixing the game, bringing everyone's work together, making sure it sounds good, um, managing a team of sound designers, audio programmers and audio QA. Um, doing review sessions with them on their work and also feedback in assigning work, working with the wider game team to make sure that uh, we audio are fulfilling the requirements that they require and vice versa, um, mentoring team members, giving them training and uh, helping them to further their creative skills, uh, project planning, lots of day-to-day -day sort of scheduling uh, with what everyone's working on and finally working with the kind of the direction team on the on the creative elements to make sure the audio direction in the project uh, is moving in the right direction. Brilliant, John. John same question. Yeah, cool. Mm. Um, well, I'm the principal audio designer on the, the Total War team. Um, I guess a lot of uh, sort of duties overlap with James, but a principal sound designer would be a bit more kind of hands-on, get to create. Um, yeah, spend more time creating assets, spend more time mixing. And one of my major functions is to help drive core technology forward. So I spend more time planning code solutions and engine team meetings and, and things like that. So, and helping spread the knowledge across the department as well. So, so the last couple of years, I spent quite a lot of time developing our mix technology for Total War and uh, developing that area of the game. Brilliant. Um, yeah, and I'll, uh, I might as well say a bit about what I do as a um, dialogue engineer. Um, so um, a dialogue engineer at Creative Assembly, basically, in a nutshell, you are um, just basically covering the entire dialogue production process start to finish. So that goes from um, scoping dialogue requirements for a game, uh, working on the dialogue design system uh, with our design teams, um, trying to find a voice for all the characters, so casting, um, directing those casting sessions, uh, working with our um, excellent writers, um, proofing scripts, getting them ready for uh, recording, then actually recording the characters, so uh, voice directing those sessions as well as engineering, um, and then getting everything implemented and balanced in game. Um, and that might require additional steps such as uh, processing for creature characters in Warhammer and also um, recording group vocalizations so we can get the sound of these massive armies uh, going um, at each other and uh, yeah, getting lots of lovely emotes and group vocalizations recorded in our studios and uh, outside as well. A lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we wear many hats. I did. I, I came on a couple of those uh, big mass recording sessions for groups. They're uh, brilliant. They're very alarming to the public when you hear yes. people. They're a lot of fun. <laughs> Shouting. Yeah, you go out in the uh, Horsham Park in all weathers. Like uh, I think the last last lot was at winter, wasn't it? And then, yeah, yeah, it was about less birds, but yeah, less birds, but um, the occasional walker with a dog and. <laughs> just looking very, very surprised at like 50 people in the field shouting. It's like uh, Yeah, just walking yeah. past doing a bit of a double take, wondering what on earth is going on there. <laughs> it's brilliant though, it adds a lot. It adds mm. a lot, that, yeah. that, that flavour. It really does. Chants and stuff. 
Yeah, it's it, nice being outdoors because you, you not only the acoustics like appropriate, but you know you've got you just you've got that space to kind of to have that many people and all feed off the same, you know, all as one kind of thing rather than you know ten people at a time and build it up. You've got that kind of just energy there straight in straight away. So yeah, so. absolutely. So um, yep, yeah, shall we answer some questions? Um, what have we got? Here? Ah, yes. Um, so, uh, what's the makeup of the audio team? Um, how big is? Um, let's start with the Total War audio team. So, um, how many are we now, John? Is it about thirty? It, it feels that many. Uh, yeah. So we're servicing four projects concurrently at the minute. So, yeah. Yeah. Include, and then DLCs as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's a large team, and don't want to leave anybody out. But um, there's director Rich um, on the music side. We've got Jack um, and Frankie, yep. and on dialogue side, we've got we've got about so, yeah, we've got about seven of us now um, on dialogue. So quite a big dialogue team. Um, we also have, yeah, we have our, our music department. We have our excellent um, audio coders who um, help us out a great deal and um, our awesome QA, um, audio QA technicians who uh, I don't know what we do without them. And um, yes, and lots and lots of excellent sound designers. How many <laughs> of them of you are there now on Total War? Six or seven. Wow. Yeah, six or seven. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a big team and um, yeah. We yeah, all share the workout. <laughs> yeah, I think we work well together. We're a good group, really good group. And uh, yeah, James, so how big is the console team in comparison? So the console, uh, yeah, so if, for people watching, if you haven't gathered, the CA is kind of split into two main teams. So there's a Total War team who have loads of stuff going on. And then there's the console team. And we, we, we kind of have been smaller in past years. We've kind of grown now as well and uh so we have our own audio team we do collaborate um at times but generally we are uh, pretty separate so whereas the total war team kind of comes across uh, strikes me as more of a central services team because you've kind of got multiple projects on the go we tend to have like a more traditional sort of one big project on the go and we'll work through the whole production line of that so we are smaller in the team i think i was just working it out when you said it because i was thinking i don't quite know I think there's I think there's about 10 of us. So uh, we've got the audio director, uh, Sam Cooper, me as the lead. Um, we've got uh, Hayden Payne, who's a senior sound designer, uh, Rob Kidd, Charles Pateman and Will Beadle as mid-levels, uh, Mari Barrett as our junior and recently joined us Melanie Moretti as our trainee and then Stuart Sowerby as the audio programmer. It's very okay, brilliant. We are. I think we're live again. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, so yeah, where were we? Um, yes, yeah, so we were talking about, um, we also have a really great audio team uh, in our sister studio in uh, CA Sophia, um, who uh, work on uh, our Total War titles as well. Um, so yeah, we were about to go into another question, weren't we? Um, so yeah, what is the um, kit and equipment that we use to uh, go and record audio outdoors? So uh, in different environments, um, and uh, yeah, what we use for the group outdoor recordings and for any other sessions. Um, James, you probably have something interesting to say on this one as for stuff that you've been recording recently. Yeah, um, I mean, I've actually got mine. I've got mine right here, sat next to me. Uh, so this is, uh, so I use a 744T, which is a sound devices uh, recorder. Uh, it's quite nice, very high end, good preamps and uh, limiters um what equipment do we use so so obviously a decent recorder is always good uh sound devices have recently released the uh the mix pre series that, that that we've been looking at for in the studio it looks pretty cool also records at 32 bit um which is exciting new tech um uh microphone wise we tend to it depends what we're recording really i mean i'm a big fan of ms rigs so uh i tend to use uh a 41 mkh 416 and an mkh 30 as the figure of eight mic um i like that because it's really mobile uh but it, de it depends on the session if you're doing something that's quite static then you might want to take like omnis or like a nice spaced pair of cardioids or something like that um 
there and, and ORTFs as well. We have like a, a, a kit for that, a Ryko kit. Um, but it depends. I mean, I know there's a lot of VR stuff going on nowadays. So um, recording with the the Ambio mics are pretty cool. Um, yeah. So, John, have you got anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, you covered it. Like, obviously, mm. if you're going to invest in kit, like your recorder is probably like <laughs> one of the one of the essential pieces to invest in. Um, I think we've got some AT forties that we use. I pair yep. those. Um, and they're good all rounders, and you know they, you know they capture a lot of detail as well because you know, we do a lot of foley recording for for creature sound effects, and that might include even going out and recording metal scrapes and trains scraping and creaking and stuff like that. So yeah, to have to have good clean mics, really good to be able to do you know a, a wide range of material to pitch stuff down later. So you know the, the better quality mics that you've got, the better recorder yeah. you've got, is, the more it clean it's going to be. It can be a bit of a tough barrier to entry, really. Um, I mean, we so because you mentioned it, so we use eighty forties too. We've got an XY um, Ryko, which Ryko is very important if you're going to be doing a lot of external recording. Um, but then, and all of the proper kind of rig for it, so you're not you're not trailing cables and getting noise and and, and handling noise and stuff. But also, uh, like I, I sometimes swap out the the mid mic on the ms rig to use an, an 8040 if you want a slightly wider mid uh, which can sound quite quite cool i did some record i've done sort of multiple recording sessions out in the states recording tanks and guns and stuff and yeah that kind of stuff is really like having a couple of different arrays and setups is really useful um you use a sankin as well don't you um, uh yeah. We do, use yeah. It in dialogue, yeah. Um, we do, yeah. We'll use it for, um, yeah, especially if we're uh, recording um, any characters that will need to be processed later. It just it gives you that that range that you need. So yeah, we'll always use the Sankin for that. Um, and yeah, you're right about uh, yeah, just trying to record from as many different perspectives as you can. That's what we do with the group vocalizations. I mean, uh, when you come to actually author all the assets and put them together um, to create those group sizes. Um, just having a stereo pair in front of the group and one behind the group, you just get such a different sound from it. It just makes it so much easier to create really nice assets. Okay, yeah. shall we move on to another question? Um, ooh, um, if someone is uh, thinking of applying uh, for a sound designer role, uh, what makes an applicant stand out from the competition? Do you want me to go or do you want to... Someone else well, go first. <laughs> we've, had a, we've had a trainee roll up recently and we had a, a, a lot of interest, like um, hundreds and hundreds of applications. And thank you for applying. Um, it's it's great that there's a lot of uh, sound designers coming into the industry as well. Like, um, it's good to know. There's a lot, of course, I mean, when I started um, quite a long time ago, that there wasn't that many game audio courses out there. Um, so there I, was, I did a music none, sound. I think. There was none when I started. Yeah. Like, been <laughs> yeah. so, so I'm not totally clued up on on where the current courses are and which ones are the, the kind of the best ones to do. But I would always say that just having a broad appreciation for um, different genres, you know, recording your own sounds, having a, a, a solid foundation of like just general audio knowledge is important. But there's also more resources out there that you can use these days, like you know the Wise Audio Venture and to be able to plug your own sounds in and to understand the nuts and bolts of, of game audio from, from the get-go without having to, to do courses at all. So on the one hand, some courses might be useful if that's your thing, but there's lots of independent learning out there that's available. And to be able to show that in a showreel and to be able to talk about game audio, not just from an aesthetic and sound design point of view, but from a, a technical and point of view is important too. And and just to be able to, to talk audio, and even if people don't, talk audio all the time because another large part of the job you'll have is talking to other disciplines and to be able to be, be yeah able to you know go and make fun disciplines is really quite a fundamental part of the job as well so communication skills definitely. oh yeah absolutely <laughs> absolutely you'll be working with a lot of different teams um and actually there's um yeah a couple of uh, related ones uh reg in regards to our um trainee role that we've we've got at the moment um people wondering uh Yep, we've already pretty much covered what we look for in a trainee um, and um, what kind of mentoring uh, we will provide them. 
yeah i mean so the the training roles on your team i mean i'll go i'll uh, just to echo a little bit of what john said there as well about what do we look for uh with applicants and stuff like that i mean i uh, i've written a few articles about this uh but it's that i think the thing that with game audio is uh the biggest thing with game audio is it's is it's because it's interactive it has a lot more technical uh there's a lot more technical knowledge you need to have uh, with how you kind of design sound for those kind of systems. And also you need to be you know, able to kind of visualize that. Um, and it's uh, and so that's a real skill in its own right. But then also um, being great at sound design is also uh, a really good skill set to have, too. So that includes linear work. Um, so when looking at kind of like um, people's show reels and stuff something that i look for a lot is a good spread of um both fantastic linear work it can be cinematic you can you know redesign on trailers and bits of in-game footage or whatever um just make sure that it's clear it's a redesign and normally you just put a little footer at the bottom um and then uh but then also what's really great is if you can then see people who've actually implemented their game their audio into game through wide and and have recorded it playing back so because yeah. immediately when you see that you know they've already kind of taken that first big step into understanding what's an event what's the parameter how do i get a bank into the game ed, game engine and da, 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 and trigger an event and that kind of stuff so um there's the wise 101 courses i think fmod do something similar um but there's a lot of tool sets out there now like the unreal engine i'm pretty sure you can download and play with for free uh -huh. you know wise have got their own um levels you can kind of talk the sounds in and out of so that's great when when i got into the industry um about uh about 10 and a half years ago 11 years ago there still weren't many tool sets around that you could do this with i think cry engine was one of them that i messed around with <laughs> But um, what I also got involved in was was game modding, which uh, can it, it's a, in my opinion, a really good kind of place to start because you're kind of working with a kind of pseudo game team at that point. Um, Mod DB is a really good place for those kind of resources. Um, I managed to get onto a couple of small mods and then did the audio for them, which then rather than me just practicing i was actually kind of working in a couple of different engines all free engines to use and we were producing a couple of small mods um i think i did a, a command and conquer mod or something like that uh but it's great because you end up with all this original material on your reel um that and you can you know polish it make it really good uh and that's what that's what i think really makes people stand out yeah absolutely Shall we um, have a look for another question? Um, oh, this is an interesting one. Um, how are you finding working remotely um, and are you still managing to record um, and achieve all of your audio work? Um, do you want me to go first on this one this time rather than just picking it to you guys? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah, because um, yeah, this one actually, um, I have to say uh, on the whole, um, I found it really great. I mean, um, CA have been amazing at getting us all set up getting us all supported getting us everything we need to work from home checking we're all okay as well you know not just that we have the tools we need but that we're all doing okay mentally i'd say the only real um struggle or the only real sort of um the main difference from how i'd work normally is um, obviously not being able to record actors um but um you know there's been lots of um ways that we've got around that i mean one thing that has really helped us is i've been really bowled over by the number of actors who've gone out there they've invested in kit they've um, come to us to ask for advice on how to set it up they've really embraced you know having to take on the engineer role as well as acting which is it's difficult to do either of those roles doing them together is is so tough so the number of people who've gone out there and been soundproofing spare rooms hanging up duvets everywhere so that we can keep going um, as well as um, you know recently studios who've been able to um, record um in the london for us while still maintaining social distances has really helped us out as well so yeah it's been interesting it's been a different way of working but um yeah it's it's gone quite well i mean have you guys done any recording um since we've uh, started with lockdown i've done a bit i've done a bit um not loads it's not it's not it depends what you're trying to do um yeah, I can't talk about too much about what it was I was recording, but it was, uh, yeah, I did, uh, yeah, it's it's tough because 
if you're trying to get it as an element to use in your sound design, like a like an ingredient, and um, that's kind of fine if you're masking it. But if it's going to be something that you're kind of uh, an element that's kind of really forefront, or it, it does help to be able to record it in a space that is non-reflective, because even kind of recording in like a bedroom. Um, it does you you just don't appreciate how much background you pick up and i mean i've tried a lot of the old tricks that i used to do as a student so like just having a duvet over the top of me as i was doing it and it works but you get qualities from that as well uh where everything starts to sound a bit pillowy um so yeah i've i've done some um but we've got uh we've got some pretty good libraries as well and a lot of custom libraries that we record in the studio so there's there's quite a lot of um material there already one thing i did record is there's currently a building site behind my house and i did stick the mic over the fence record a load of diggers and cranes and stuff when they weren't watching <laughs> always <laughs> useful yeah I, I, I haven't been doing much uh, recording recently but um obviously with lockdown it would have been a good time to go out and get some nice ambiences with less traffic and stuff but um uh but i've, I've you know been thinking about you know using the time productively with you know things i'm going to do on the side look with the um there's lots some devices like light to sound and stuff like that just put got an order and that's coming through in a bit so the stuff we can still do around the home in without necessarily having a professional recording environment so you can do bits of folio it's difficult for me because i've got um young family so so kids in the house and stuff like that to go and record folio at home is quite difficult but uh Plenty of baby screams if you need them, Vic. Like, Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll have to take you up on that. <laughs> yeah. And how have you guys found um, just working remotely in general? It's been good. As you said, like, CA have been really, really good with, like, providing the kit and the support and the um, and sort of the weekly updates and, and keeping all the teams, like, you know, talking to each other over Teams. Mm -hmm. And it, it's been great. Um, you know, I, I do miss the, the you know, being with people in person and just, just having those conversations and and the kind of the ideas that spark like in a face-to-face -face conversation and the, the yeah. kind of random conversations that you get in an office environment but um but yeah it's, it's it's gone as well as it could have done yeah how about you Vic have you found um yeah I've, I've I found it um yeah really good I mean aside from yeah having to um like the first few weeks when we were all trying to find um solutions <laughs> as to how we were going to record actors um yeah on the whole um yeah really good I mean yeah like we've all said it's just you know we've had that level of support where you know it's gone about as um seamlessly as it could have done um yeah um ooh, uh we've got another question here um, so someone saw um, our um, folio video, the uh, the fruit one, um, and they'd like to know how we come up with the um, ideas for things like that and what sounds will work. Um, should I say that because I think you might have seen my shoulder in that video. I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah so, your famous shoulder. Yeah, my yeah. famous shoulder. <laughs> uh, yeah. Are you the one smashing the watermelon? <laughs> no, that was Dave with the sword. I think. <laughs> Dave gets the dangerous jobs. I get to keep my fingers. Um, it's good. It's a good arrangement. Um, yeah, I I did Foley. I I, so I worked in TV and film post for for a while before joining Games, and worked at a really great um, Foley production house um, that did Foley for uh, feature films and and things like that. So just being around that, like um, in my early career, was just like you know you get a feel for recording techniques and and what kind of sounds work well and where to get props and what kind of things work but yeah how to distill that down into experimentation just just yeah. as you can say if you've got your own gear like um just get what you can and and um just try things and and see how it works like there's there's no better learning mechanism for recording than doing it honestly um you, you'll find out like there's there's at least 10 ways to record something and they'll all be interesting in some way um um, and there's no no mistakes to be had. You, you fill your hard drive up with material, but like just keep track of like the good stuff, and you'll keep coming back to it as well as as ideas and little components and things. So, so there's no wasted opportunities for just doing your own recording and trying things out. We did a similar thing with Alien. Actually, uh, we had like it wasn't like your fruit session. There was a there was a 
bucket of slop session, uh, which yeah. had, uh, I mean, it, it was horrible. It stank the studios out after we had to get rid of it. But it was, um, it was like dog meat and nuts and vegetables and stuff all kind of like in, in like this trough and we did like loads of slime stuff that uh but it was good because you could you a lot of that material we could we could kind of work into the movement sounds of, of the aliens and stuff like that and it just i mean i guess the question like how do you know what to record it is experimentation there are some kind of really famous kind of ones that you come across uh uh you know i think was it cornstarch for snow and stuff like this so but it's yeah you just i mean i guess you start uh thinking about things it's not what the thing is it's what sound does it make so you yeah. just you know you spend a lot of time going around like a hardware store just kind of knocking <laughs> things together being like that's just got the right resonance that i want we often uh so in the in the console team foley cupboard we've got a load of uh metal that we've kind of picked up from you know scrap yards and things like that that we often use for for things because they're just you know drain covers are really useful and stuff like that so you're trying to do big impacts and it's amazing what you can achieve with stuff in in the in a photo studio mm. yeah but experimentation is definitely the key yeah absolutely um oh here we go another one uh so um how do we go about dividing sound design work uh, within our team? Uh, do people ask for specific work based on their preferences? Uh, who wants to go first on that one? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess there's probably a difference between, you know, as you were saying, you're working on a project and you've got it planned out uh, in one roadmap, whereas we've got slightly different requirements on Total War, but yeah. Yeah, do you want to go first? Yeah, so, um, it's a bit of both, I think. So um, one one of the things that we've always been really keen on uh, at CA is to not uh, kind of pigeonhole people into doing one thing for ages, because that sometimes can happen and you get like the UI guy and then the UI guy just does UI. And then because they're good at UI on the next project, they just do more UI and stuff. And you kind of can, um, get people who become very good at one thing, but it's it does mean that you um, you do kind of, you know, don't don't give people the opportunities to grow into into working in other areas within that within a soundscape of a game. So what we try and do is allow people to kind of work on different things. But we like on our team we we have people who are kind of responsible for areas and then depending on what the where the workload is at any point, you might get you know, someone comes and helps do UI because that tends to come in later on a game because it takes the UI team ages to go and get their stuff ready. And we kind of swarm onto different things, but you do need to have people who are kind of working in that area primarily because there's a lot of technical setup. And if that, you know, you can't have everyone chucking stuff in, you need to have uh, people who are kind of experts on that stuff. But yeah, I mean, to some extent, earlier in projects we will go who wants to do this you know do you want to do servo stuff or who wants to do like movement and foley or who wants to do weaponry or, or whatever different projects split it up in different ways i mean total war is quite a different different beast to what we work on over the road so i mean saying that halo wars was relatively similar it being a, an rts mm. different scale though Tiny, yeah, little, little bit different scale. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the I, I suppose one of the, one of the things is we do need we do have people that kind of look after areas of the game, but we we do kind of well, be it creatures, for example, or or abilities and magic or um, cinematics and, and things. So they all sort of the ownership gets split up. Um, and you, as James says, you kind of you do need one person knowing the the implementation or the the pipeline as such, and being the point of contact for other disciplines. But the actual work, um, yeah, is as James says, we try we try not to get in the point where everybody's just working on the same thing constantly because that you know that's that, that's not enjoyable long term. Yeah. Um, but and it's it's you know it's yeah it's it's what James said really. It's, uh, Spreading yeah. it up so that people get a, a variety of things to work on. It's not just the same thing. Yeah, especially kind of, 
go on sorry no go, go for it go for it just say especially as people work up through their careers as well you know is you do get points where you're like, i've done i've done the music system or i've done this for a couple of years now i want to try something else you know so and it's cool we can we can often try and accommodate that um you know you do have you can't you know, but some areas of sound design uh and, and implementation technical systems are really complicated. So you maybe don't, you know, let people touch that stuff until they've got slightly far farther along with their skill sets and things. But um, yeah, we do pr very much promote sort of mobility around. Sorry, Vic, what were you going to say? Um, yeah, I was just going to say that it's kind of um, similar in dialogue as well, where um, you'll generally um, you'll have a senior who sort of handles. Um, everything involved in a certain project. So you're generally, most of us will be concentrating on um, a certain project, a certain Total War title. And then, yeah, so like you guys said, it's like, you know, you don't want people to get bored. You don't want, you know, you want people to be able to work on a broad range of things. Um, and then it's quite nice as well that if someone's working on a huge tempo release, then, um, you know, another um, dialogue engineer can come on board and essentially be their wingman and take on board some tasks and you can sort of work in tandem. So, I mean, it's a really um, essential part of our job, I think, is just being able to collaborate. And one of the really fun things as well, fun things I like most about our job. Um, yeah, absolutely. Right. Here we go. Oh, I've just noticed a very quick question um, for me. Um, what's that excellent <coughs> fantasy art on your wall? I'm presuming you're talking about this lovely thing here. This. Um, I managed to get hold of is actually a um, Ollie Moss original. So um, it's a triptych of um, it's Majora's mask, basically. It's um, the three um, masks uh, that Link gets that change him into the Deku scrub, the Goron and the Zora. So, uh, yes, I'm glad you noticed that. And thank you very much. Um, OK, let's uh, back to business. <laughs> um, what advice would you give to someone who wanted to transfer from a different audio discipline, such as um, live sound, theatre, etc., to game sound design? John, do you want to go first? Mm, um, yeah, I did a little bit of front of house when I was younger. Um, it, again, again, that, that foundation of how audio works, like you, you know, um, is really useful. But, and, but as we talked about with the, the trainee role, it's there's there's so many resources out there like you know we were talking about the, the wise adventure and uh, the 101 and and th there's there's lots of um youtube videos now as well about game audio design um it's, it's really really useful there's a really good one i watched recently a breakdown of uh, like how they do the weapons on borderlands and stuff like that and just just sparking ideas about and then getting insights about how you know not only the sounds are created and the layers involved but as james says you know the how you technically would create a weapon or, or an environment that's dynamic and reacts to the game state conditions and you know the player's perspective and understanding how you know one event in a game might be like heard by the player in lots of different you know situations so um yeah just getting your hands dirty really and just start making making games any way you can and, um, and making assets any way you can is, is the best way i think yeah, I mean, I I started off here as a studio engineer, actually, uh, recording bands, so uh, and doing a bit of front of house as well. So I I did uh, I discovered post in my undergrad and uh, suddenly was like, wow, what is this? Because before you know A level when when I was at college, you didn't there were there wasn't really any music tech at that point, um, not not formal courses, and I discovered uh, sound design one of the uni really enjoyed the modules on it and then and then i discovered that game sound design was a thing and i couldn't believe that and i was like whoa well cool job so i kept but when i came out it was very hard to get into at the time there were less studios and there was practically no information on it um so i just started writing to companies networking but also just working on your kind of skill sets and and in, in between that i also ended up going into studio recording and all of that stuff's relevant you know knowledge of of mic techniques and and things knowing some post is good um you know linear sound design and stuff like that uh actually being able to sound design to picture and and understanding the the sort of audio visual relationship of what it does um and then you know game audio specifically is 
the other element and we kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier is you know it's it's understanding it's a lot more technical so there's still a lot of technical stuff in film sound design and, and tv but that's more audio engineering kind of side and the creative side but you have a lot more problems with interactive because you you suddenly like how do you deal with, like john said with changing state conditions or feeding stuff back to the player based on parameters uh and how do you make that sound good um car engines in games are a really good example of that incredibly complicated to do guns mm. as well uh weaponry um but even like in total war like mixed states depending on camera height and things like that what do you hear um halo wars we did a mixed system that was kind of similar that, that, that used like a spotlight technology depending on what was going on and how high you were and it, yeah that that requires a lot of technical know-how and yeah you know just getting stuck into the tool sets and breaking your kind of workflow and thinking out of linear mm. is kind of the key and it's yeah it's hard it's hard to do at first you know same with music the way music can be stacked is like a vertical mix or there's loads of different ways it can be done and you see it in a lot of a lot of video games over the last 20 years you know there's amazing systems that people have built and just dreamed up but you've got to have that kind of knowledge base there that you you'll only get through just doing it yeah what, what, one of the pitfalls i came straight over from from doing linear to, to um, game audio was just the so, so say you're designing a creature sound and you know it's going to have attack sounds and pain sounds and death sounds and some foley and some melee attacks and maybe a fire breath or something and you go right i'm going to sit down and design all these sounds but then you just realize how much material you just need in the first place to create the number of vari varieties of things so it's no good just making one attack sound i've got to make five or six of them potentially more because there's you know more animations that are slightly different or you know there might be 20 of these on screen at one time and just from even just starting to create your sounds just knowing how they're going to play at like 50 meters in the game 200 meters in the game and just realizing how to break down components of of sounds rather than just making one asset that sounds good. It's just, it's how are you going to make a palette of sounds sound good in all the different situations? That's That was the main jump from yeah. linear to, to game audio, really. Repetition as well, it's a big one. Repetition oh, yeah. as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but did you already cover that? Sorry, I was reading the questions. <laughs> the... Yeah, repetition. Repetitions, repetition. Okay. Yeah, repetition. Yeah, yeah. Repetition. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> it's kind of a jo unintentional joke. The um, yeah, that's a big killer. You know, uh, fatigue in in game audio yeah. as well. Uh, yeah. If you're, you know, we've all had it. I'm sure where you're playing a game and you keep hearing the same thing again and again, or there's only two variants of a pain emo or something like that. And yeah. Yeah, it can it can it can really start to break you out of the immersion, and that's kind of what you know part of our goal is sound uh, professionals is is to build as build a kind of an audio experience that matches the game experience and, and kind of draws you into it so you don't want start anything that's going to try and trip you out of that yeah i mean just just like with linear there's sometimes where audio has to be just in the background doing its thing not being noticed and you know you're doing your job well if it's not being noticed and it's it's serving the picture and the, the game design and, and everything else but there's there's no also knowing you know how to do that not make a system you know behave in a way that it sticks out like like you're saying repetition or just you know um making making audio sit and function well and not and not draw the ear to, to an obvious bug that causes like fatigue or just like an annoyance or something like that is, is also yeah. quite useful um it's kind of it is interesting as well because depending on the uh depending on what kind of game you're making you know um the way the audio kind of works with the with the graphics and the game design and everything is can be really different so like a alien was uh, like a really really good uh vehicle for sound because horror as a genre generally is and first person so uh because it becomes you know about what what you can't, what the picture can't show you, it's all you're you're providing the player kind of 360 degrees worth of, of uh, telegraphy, game gameplay telegraphy. So, not only are you are you creating audio that's kind of really putting you in that space, the sound of Sevastopol and the immersion, but also 
you're giving them a lot of like real time gameplay cues. Um, mm. And so in that respect, you know, the sound becomes really important because uh, it's so, yeah, but it's one of those things. If you're doing it well, people, it just becomes, it should just become a seamless experience. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Alien Isolation is just a perfect example of where, you know, audio can can help support the gameplay in really interesting ways. And um, yeah, still one of my favourite games. So thank you for doing that. One. Yes, <laughs> oh, I love that game. <laughs> it wasn't me on my own. There is there's, yeah. there's quite a few of us, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. I spent a lot of time hidden in cupboards and under tables. <laughs> Uh, in that game, it's brilliant. Um, right, shall we? Um, actually, yeah, I keep picking the questions. Is there any other ones that anyone's spotted on the list that they uh, they want to go at? Number five, side quest HQ. Mm. Uh, hi guys, enjoying the stream. Would love to know some of your quick and dirty tips for creating sound effects for uh, games on small projects like jams. Game jams. Any. Any tips? Mm, I think it depends what you need, <laughs> really. Um, uh, depends on the well, format of the game. Yeah. So in some regards, yeah. I mean, I mean, I would very much like you know game. Jam- I've done a few game jams over the years. They're very, very cool ways to build your skills and mm. and collaborate with other people in other disciplines. And I think as Vic, you mentioned, like collaboration is a big part of game development. Yeah, um, because you spend a lot of time working with other departments and where you fit into that pipeline. So, you know, it's it's very much not about being holed up in a studio somewhere and not talking to anyone else. Because, you know, game game development is uh, about kind of getting, you know, the best or get a game sound design rather is about getting the best opportunities to get sound design work in and music and and dialogue or working. Mm with the game throughout development and um you know it's not like a traditional model where you just get delivered the kind of edit from you know the editor at the end and you just yeah yeah. there's the cut and off you go because you you have to be working with the programmers all the way through the designers animation is big part of it vfx um there's loads of different departments that you're constantly interacting with and you know uh either providing stuff for them or, or they're giving information to you and it's uh yeah so game jams going off on our side track there i'd <laughs> yeah. say i'd say um i mean synths are really cool you know yeah. they can be a really quick way to get some really cool yeah sound also write music as well you know game jams are a great way to kind of do some fun little uh projects chip tune stuff um but yeah Synths, I think, definitely. I mean, yeah, game game jams are really good, but like, just to create quick sound effects. Like, as I think you'll you'll start. It, it depends how far into your career you are. Like, if you've got recording gear and if you've got your own custom library that you built up over time, you you obviously bought libraries and I just you build up a collection of stuff that um, is a useful toolkit. I think for getting assets done um to, to a certain level quickly um and as james says like knowing your way around a synthesizer is really handy as well um just for mocking stuff up really quickly as well mm. um so yeah just have, have as many tools in your arsenal as possible you know just like you know your own cost, your own library is going to be good and just keep adding to it over time um and then just you know have have props around that you can you can make stuff with um just to hand if you can <laughs> mm. uh, or just you know um get behind the mic and make noises yourself just get a yeah. bit comfortable there you know then you can do processing on the um, uh, get some quite interesting stuff that way as well yeah oh yeah get comfortable with your own voice because yes. that is a that is a sound design you know tool right there it's like you know like making creature vocals and, and everything it's just like you know you can morph that you can use that to you know modulate other things it's like you know even by itself by like pitched down and pitched around and stretched you know you can make all sorts of nice effects so yeah get comfortable with your own voice as well can be very weird hearing your own voice back actually yeah. uh, i remember yeah. i was just because i don't do that much work on the total war projects but uh, i did a few years ago with you john and i was doing some of the early stuff uh, 3k ui for that the ink aesthetic and uh oh. I remember I had a uh, a little hand drum and I was humming through the back of it 
to get some really weird textures and recording that and then putting it into a library and stuff like that and it, yeah it sounds ridiculous when you hear it back but as a um, quick technique it just using your voice for things can be really useful mm. um, yeah yeah definitely I mean it, yeah there's lo there's loads of kind of workflow things you can do as well I mean having libraries is cool um, but expensive as well mm. Actually, that's... Sorry, Sorry, go, go on. On. <laughs> I, just, yeah. I, I record a lot of my own stuff and, and have done over the years. I mean, I started off with a, uh, a Zoom H4 recorder, uh, but not the N. It was before that. It was, uh, yeah, it looked like a taser. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but I, yeah, I, I was... Uh, I think I remember those ones. Yeah, yeah the yeah. grey ones. Yeah, I think I got stopped with it once. But um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, I mean the, you know, the quality on it now is not brilliant. But yeah, you, you can... Get stuff together pretty quick for projects. Uh, just a handheld's good as well. Yeah. Actually, that does segue into quite nicely one of the other questions. Um, do we always record our own sounds at CA, or do we ever use um, pre-made assets um, from Paxport Online um, that we edit? Um, and is using pre-made assets frowned upon for AAA games? I mean, just straight off the bat, like very, very rarely would you ever buy a pre-made asset even mm -hmm. some of the really pristine cinematically designed hits that you can buy like would you ever take an asset and it goes straight into the game and it lives there the whole project and, and ships with it in just you know straight out of a library i don't think that ever happens no um so it, it, like even doing creature sound design you'd be taking layers and and, and c c literally constructing a, a, a new creature from from a wide variety of sources it's not you know it's not off the shelf yeah absolutely i mean sometimes yeah i mean we we never we never put stuff in wholesale and uh i get i guess it yeah i guess it probably in triple a games it would be a little bit frowned upon i mean like there's no like police out there that are going to come <laughs> in and say no you know uh, you're not allowed to the sound police you're not allowed to use this but it's um wholesale but you, yeah i mean you don't want to because right. you know part of our job as sound designers is to and dialing engineers and stuff is to create a character create a you know stuff that works for a sword swipe or a gun or an atmosphere an ambience or whatever and you're trying to you know it's custom made otherwise it would all be out of libraries and you know having sound libraries is massively valuable because um you know we are obviously working you know, quite often we're working to pretty tight deadlines and you know, things become, you actually work through projects, they go from pre-production to production to becoming final, and then you've got to redo the sound or whatever. And sometimes you don't have the opportunity to go out and record things, or those things are just too ex expensive to record or too dangerous to record or whatever. Like mm. if you need, you know, earthquakes or volcanoes or lions or whatever. And, and so being able to have that stuff recorded to a really high quality in a library is brilliant um but we would generally kind of you know process it uh design it in with other other sounds to create something that fits bespokely to to whatever you're trying to do um yeah it'd be rare that you'd ever find something you could just drop on and it kind of worked perfectly yeah it's not really the fact that you you, even if you could find the, the right the one sound that really worked you have you have to, like we said earlier it's about the variation and just in different contexts and you know you need to make different categories of a creature or a, a gunshot even you know you need to make a distant version and a close version and you know you, yeah you, you, and you end up having more fun constructing stuff anyway so yeah it's, yeah it's yeah I mean, that's one of the things that going back to the kind of the showreel stuff we were talking earlier as well, it's just is, is you know, is to slightly beware of is there's nothing wrong. Some some places will say we want everything original. I mean, that sometimes can be a little bit unrealistic if they then give you a scene that is like, you know, racing cars or. Yeah, rockets. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, but it's but it's, you know, at the same time, it's like it's not generally a good idea to just drop stuff in from libraries because we all hear them a lot. Um, as we're in our day-to-day -day jobs so it is you know the ear does get to know some of the stuff yeah. hear where it's coming from so um yeah always try to kind of you know there's nothing wrong with working with that concept but don't don't generally use it wholesale um yeah 
Cool. Um, shall we um, answer a couple of questions here about um, trainees? Um, so someone's wondering, uh, what was a um, what's a deciding factor um, you'd find uh, in choosing a particular trainee over other um, trainees? And what sort of work would a uh, trainee do when they first start with us? Wow, Vic. That's a, that's a tough one, honestly. It is a tough one, that's yeah. A really tough um, one. Oh, uh, so, I'm not sure. Do you want me to go you... while she thinks about it? Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's kind of a yeah. I mean, I I I kind of just treat it like any other junior role. So it's kind of you're you're just looking for all those things we were talking about earlier, like you know the people that stand out and kind of work really hard and have this you know have the the potential there uh the skills and you can see that they're really keen on doing it and um it's going those extra miles to kind of stand out because it you know i mean it I, i've all i always believe that you know if you work hard enough you can get into game audio it's um and you know you, you build up those skills and stuff but it is a tough industry sometimes um you know there are lots of people wanting to do these jobs so like uh, always keep an eye out for these kind of junior position roles when they come up. And there, there have been a lot more of them in recent years, I've noticed, um, which is really good. Um, you know, what what is it that makes you choose a particular trainee over another? I, it's kind of just like the same as why would you choose a junior role over another? You know? um, mm. uh, it's, yeah, just, just how good their material is. You can You can see when people shine through with where they've worked really hard to kind of make themselves stand out. Um, uh, and then I, I was just going to say with, with the point of view, like what would a trainee do? What are they? I mean, I mean, what we what we try to do with trainees is to give them a really good, um, you know, broad spread of everything. So they get to so they're not just working on one thing, but they get to experience, you know, working on Foley weapons, engines, whatever. And so. Um, you know, at the end of a traineeship, they don't go away and say, oh, well, I've only just worked on this one thing, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just like, you know, again, it's a thing about, you know, learning a broad spectrum of skills, because the more things that, you know, the more strings you can add to your bow, the better you're going to be. Um, yeah, it's a bit different for dialogue because, um, yeah, there's, um, there's a lot of, um, you know, it's so bespoke that there's a lot of skills that sort of, you know, you will get doing you know recording dialogue for other mediums or um, working as an engineer or as a voice actor uh, as a voice um, sorry a voice director <laughs> um, uh, that sort of um, initial experience is something good that you can take into you know a role in uh, games audio in games dialogue um, but yeah I'd say um, just an interest in uh, performance in games and also just in how stories are told for games you know if you've got that interest in you know how the voice is used in game how different um assets are used um you know how the stories develop and how the voice plays a role in that i mean that was the thing that really hooked me and made me fall in love with games dialogue is just because i just love game stories and the linear aspect of it and how they can go off in so many different directions and you know instead of it just going from you know start to finish you can go off on however many different tangents and how you keep a narrative and a character going through that um yeah, if, if that's stuff that interests you, then yeah, you know, game dialogue might be for you. <laughs> Shall we move on yeah. to another question? Could we do number three? Like, yes, please, we please. can. Can we do number yes. three? I was yes. just looking at, at that one, yeah. I was wondering about that one. If there are any um, people interested in audio programming out there, please, please, please really consider it and get into it because um, it's such a rare thing in this industry um everybody is, like, is looking for audio programs all the time so you always find a job um <laughs> guaranteed um but it is such a symbiotic relationship audio designers have with audio coders and we can't do our stuff if we don't have audio coders of you know we're, we're blessed at ca to have you know a good number of audio programmers who, who know their stuff and enable us to do our best work so um what's the original question how do you get into it um yeah. i think uh again with just general game audio like a solid foundation of programming um c plus plus is obviously useful you know like 
I, I'm not an audio coder. I wish I'd gone down that path earlier in my career as well, um, to learn more about it. But it's such a require, you know, it's such a necessary role in in game audio. Like, yeah, it's please, a lot. Of, it's a lot about building building kind of custom systems. You know, when you play yeah. your 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 Last of Us or your you know uh, Witcher Three or all of these fantastic games, and, and you. you you have great experiences, but those systems, you know, they're not they're not using all the time. They're not just using out of the box tech. You know, a lot of that stuff is written behind the scenes by by audio programmers. So they are the yeah, they are the ones that are right, that, that kind of and it's very exciting working with them because they can come up with brilliant systems and try and understand things from an audio point of view. That's always interesting. Yeah. Our, our audio programmers, you know, they're quite into doing music and stuff like that so like digital music so they uh they have an interest there but i th also think like with the with the next kind of generation of consoles and stuff like that something you're starting to see a lot in in uh presentations and things is more focused on audio and 3d audio especially um so it's interesting because i think that you know audio programming is 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 something that's going to, you're going to see a lot more of in in the next gen of consoles, um, ray traced audio stuff like this. It's it's all it's all kind of new frontier, but yeah, audio programmers are very rare, so yes. it's a good thing to get into. Absolutely, and very very highly valued by all of us. Yeah. Um, I think we've got two minutes left. I think we've got um, time for one more question. So should we go for the um, bottom question? Question four. Um, since yeah it's a nice one to end on so uh what project have you felt proud to be part of and uh, do you feel um has impacted uh, the audio within it or which one have we just enjoyed the most what's our favorite project i mean for me it's, you know it's got to be alien isolation um that was a a gift for audio that project yeah. and working with the audio team uh then on it was fantastic um, I didn't work on the entire project. I, I came in about halfway through, um, but it was yeah a few years, and it was yeah it was a brilliant one to work on. Yeah, I wish I'd been able to work on that. It just you know everything I've heard from working on it just sounds really awesome. How about you, you both? Um, I think with me, I think in terms of uh, since I've been at CA. Um, one project that, that sticks out is um, being able to work on the um, Curse of the Vampire Coast DLC for Warhammer. That was a lot of fun to work on, recording uh, zombie pirates, uh, putting together groups for those. Um, also, it was one of the first projects I worked on uh, when I started at CA. So it was, um, and coming from a um, sort of out, um, games dialogue outsourcing background, um, it was the first one where it was, I was really involved in the um, trying to work out how the characters should sound, how we're going to achieve that, and actually getting the dialogue in game as well that was you know it was almost a little bit emotional first time i actually got a character that i'd recorded and cast and then was actually putting it in game and you know tweaking everything and balancing it in there um i have particularly um fond memories of um silostra diaphin or dirafan as she calls herself that was a really fun recording session i uh, had an um, awesome actress charlotte moore who plays her and yeah really pleased with them um, with how the character turned out yeah, I, I think Vampire Coast was one of my favourites because it's about the time um, we did a big overhaul on the group systems and um, just the mix just took on a whole new breath of life as well. And um, But I think, yeah, touching back on the audio programming topic, like um, we did a really big mix change um, in Profit and the Warlock. Um, we interested the concept, concept of like um, focus mixing and just, just pulling the mix around depending on what was going on screen with creatures and stuff. And we were that was a system that, you know, worked very closely with the with John Birch, the audio programmer. And mm -hmm. that was to me like almost two years of thought paying off like in one DLC and, and just that all coming together and changing the mix and stuff. That was that was that was quite satisfying to work on. So that that's probably the highlight for me. Again, collaboration, working with other people and and uh, yeah, delivering something you're proud of is is yeah. Oh it feels great. It feels great. <laughs> Yeah, really nice. Um, 
Well, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's all we've got time for. Um, about ready to wrap this up. Um, so, yeah, I just want to say to everyone watching, thank you so, so much for joining us for this live Q&A. Um, and thank you for all your lovely questions. Um, we're looking to do more of these in the future so that you will have the opportunity to speak to more experts um, from different disciplines here at Creative Assembly. So please um, keep an eye out on our uh, social media channels uh, for news on those. So, yeah, thanks everyone again. And uh, goodbye from us here at CA. Bye, guys. Bye.